Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, very, very nice to see you. Uh, I'm Robbie Schneider. I'm the chairman of Letter Exchange at the moment, and it is very nice that our speaker tonight has uh, was keen, in fact, I would have to say, to, to speak to us in person, uh, because obviously what we're really hoping for is to, to come back to the Art Workers Guild on a, on a full-time basis. Uh, so, well, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Tashi Mannox is a world-renowned calligrapher who spent 17 years in a very unique position uh, as a monk in a Tibetan monastery, studying and working as a scribe and has become expert in the traditional Tibetan Buddhist tr tradition. And without wishing to preempt you, Tashi, uh, you have said that your purpose is to hold and protect the language of the Tibetan religion and faith. And I'm sure that you'll tell us a, a lot more about that um, and about your work and yourself. But I would just like to add uh, that Tashi was one of the scribes who participated in Brody Neuenschwander's uh, performance piece, Brush with Silence, that Letter Exchange hosted as part of our 30th anniversary conference, conference in 2018 in Cambridge. So, Thank you very much, Tashi. Well, thank you very, very much indeed for such a nice, warm welcome. Um, in such a beautiful place of, of great history, I'm just looking around the wa walls and all these, these masters here as part of the guilds. Uh, so it's, it's very, very nice to be just a little bit part of that. And welcome to everybody here and everybody online as well. Um, it is uh, great. <coughs> so I'm asked um, to give a lecture on, as this says, on Tibetan calligraphy. Uh, it's a huge subject. So there's a map, a map of the world, and this is really just to put into perspective, really. Although we have this area we're called um, it was actually called the uh, autonomous region of Tibet by, by its neighbours. Um, actually, Tibet itself covers a much larger area. Over here is Kam and up into Amdo. Now, the Tibetan Empire, we could call it, did at, at, at its peak have influence and reach right up into Mongolia. As Tibetan Buddhists who practice there, up into Buryata, also down into <clears throat> India, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim is here, over here, down into Burma, into Yunnan, there's this, this area of Yunnan, the nor northern area is very Tibetan Buddhist, over into um, as far as Chengdu right over here. Now, if we compare this huge area of Tibetan Buddhists that was really the, um, the cradle, you could say, that, that endorsed Tibetan calligraphy, if we compare this huge area of India, India is a very, very large area. It's a very large country, huge in fact. And compare the size of Tibet and the nations to, to India. You could nearly fit most of Europe into Tibet and these outer regions. And if we, as we know with Europe, how many different countries, how many different cultures, how many different calligraphy styles there are in Europe or with different languages. So if we come up into Pakistan here, Afghanistan, they were Buddhist countries at one time. The Tibetan language even had an influence here. Um, in the south of Pakistan on the coast. And if you see here on the banner, there's Tibetan. Even today, it actually says, Ya Hasim Muslim. So incredible to think that even now, even today, right down to the coast, uh, there's 
it's still the influence of the Tibetan language. When I saw this photograph, I was very surprised. So here's this, obviously, is the alphabet family tree. When I first started to study Tibetan, I was just a boy um, with two, I met these old Tibetan lamas and I was incredibly interested, more because these Tibetan lamas were very happy, friendly, loving people. And obviously the way that they become so happy and, and gregarious and, and down to earth, very sane, is because of their practice of Buddhism. So I became interested in learning Tibetan from a very, very young age. Oh, and back again. And if we look at this family tree from the origins of the Egyptian hieroglyphics, we can come right down into the Sanskrit from Greek, Gupta script, down to Tibetan, and we'll deal with this other style here, Pagpa. Now this really comes to the very edge of the family tree and anything this side over here are the Han, the, the Chinese languages. So really Tibetan is at the very edge of our own language systems, which is quite amazing. And as I said, from studying this as a child, I used to think it was such an alien language, so, so different, but it's not so different at all. Um, and we'll see why as we go through. And to conclude the talk, I'll share something with you. So if we go from the Gup Gupta scripts, which is the origin here, Brahmi, Brahmi and Gupta, these are the Sanskrit based, of course, um, in the regions of, of India, Northern India. The history, we could say, of the Tibetan language is a little bit vague, it's debatable. There isn't any strong, um, strong papers written on it. There's, there's different opinions even between the Tibetans themselves, but we'll go into that more. So if we go to the next one. So here we, we show the Brahmi script, very um, basic. Gupta becomes a little bit more um, sophisticated stylized and then this is the modern day Devanagari which is um, Hindi used of course in India for newsprint and for their written language and you can see a direct um, relationship between this and the uh, Tibetan uh, script style so if we go to the next this is another um, example of uh, Devanagari the characteristic of this, this uh, Sanskrit form or Sanskrit based letters is that the letters hang down from the horizontal line. Of course, as we know from English and all the other European languages, we write up from the line, but this is very characteristic of Sanskrit. So next. And here, much earlier on, Devanagari is much more of a later style of, um, of uh, writing. This here is called Lenza, which is a very early form of Sanskrit. It has a sister, if you like, called Wartu. The difference is that the head, um, as you see, is waved here. It has a, a waved head. It doesn't have such a strong uh, angular head although still it's written down from, from top. This here, um, for those of you uh, maybe interested, this is the Tibetan equivalent. It's the mantra of compassion, of loving kindness, and it's written down here, Oma Nipemi Hum. So just to show the comparison of these three scripts, some years ago, I visited um, Varanasi, uh, which is one of the main um, Varanasi in Sarnath, which is one of the, the Buddhist uh, pilgrim places, it's the place where Buddha finally became enlightened. Um, and there is uh, an ancient uh, stupa or pagoda there. And very interesting amongst the rubble of all the, the broken stones from this ancient temple was, was one stone that had this uh, 
this style of Sanskrit carved into it, which really put it in, uh, in its place. A bit like the risotto stone, risotto stone of, of Sanskrit and Tibetan, if you like. Uh, next, please. So here's an example <clears throat> of one of the early manuscripts in this early form of uh, Lanza. This is slightly different, a slightly different uh, form. Of course, the, the Himalayas is, the stretch of the Himalayas is very, very long. And there's many different forms of Sanskrit itself, right along the whole length of the, the Himalayas. Next, please. Here is the later form, which is called Ranjana. Now, I've, I've put this here because quite often people would get Lanza, this earlier form of Sanskrit, mixed up with Ranjana. They do relate, but this is much later on, and a system, a writing system that's still used today uh, in, in Nepal, Kathmandu. There's a bit of a, uh, a revival, even in Kathmandu itself. There's a lot of young people rewriting it, which is very encouraging. Uh, below which is the, the Tibetan uh, phonetics of what this is said, and then the actual translation in Tibetan um, below. So if you move on. So talking about the history, the development and the history of um, Tibetan Buddhism and, and the writing systems. Now this uh, character here is known as uh, Tommy Sambuta. And he's from the seventh century. And this is the, some say it's the, um, the actual account of how the Tibetan writing system began. There were earlier systems um, before this, but basically as Buddhism was migrating into Tibet, most of the scriptures, the Buddhist canons um, and teachings all in Sanskrit needed translating uh, into uh, Tibet, which is becoming very much becoming Buddhist. And it was soon realized really, probably over a long period of time, that the, the indigenous Tibetan language there, written language was inadequate for the, the depth and, and breadth and the, of the uh, Sanskrit. So one of the first kings of, um, of Tibet, Songtheng Gam, um, Gampo, uh, what is it, 632, so quite early on, realizing this, he chose one of his ministers along with, with a few others and sent them to India to learn Sanskrit so that they could form properly form the Tibetan written language. Now this, this is a, a traditional Tibetan tanker painting that I actually commissioned uh, because there's very few uh, images that document. Um, he was the only minister that was able to return from uh, India. Others got distracted, killed, died of a heat or whatever. Uh, he was the only one who returned and was able to, to form the basis of the Tibetan written language um, that's still used today. The example here is that on this tablet is written the mantra Omani Pema um, which I will move on to, um, was one of the first examples of this script that he presented um, to the king. Up here above him, there's two root letters here. Um, it's the last letter of the alphabet. One is in the classical Uchen script. One is in the classical Ume script. There's two major um, areas of the Tibetan calligraphy. The Uchen script on this side, this is what we call the classical script. Uchen, Chen means, U means it has head. The script that has a head. And ume me means not, is the script that is headless. So it's a stylistic um, difference. This is really used for many of the, the Buddhist or the Dharma uh, manuscripts. This is really used for handwriting styles. That, um, 
to, from quite formal through to very cursive and, and quick styles. So if we go to the next. So I mentioned earlier the uh, origins of the, the Brahmic scripts. So this is a very early form of Gupta, we can see. Obviously, it has been copied or traced and put onto this paper. It looks, as a, a calligraphy, it looks quite, you could say, uh, a little bit naive, you know, not such a beautiful style. But actually, it's so old, of course, that any, um, if they did have paper, they probably wrote on wood, nothing really survives today. So most likely this would have been copied from something that's engraved in metal or carved in stone, which is not exactly the, the best medium to have beautiful writing. So it looks a bit basic. So here below is the Tibetan equivalent. And you can see like this, let, this is the alphabet here. There's letter Ga here. You can see similarities to this. There's a, there's a lot of debate, you know, of the origin of Tibetan, where it comes from. But this, to me, is pretty close. You know, you can see many, many similarities uh, between them. So this is um, the original mantra that Tommy Sambuta carved and presented to the uh, King of Tibet. Unfortunately, it doesn't survive anymore. It was, it was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, uh, if you go to the next. Um, but it has been represented here in this, this tanker, quite stylized, but it's, it, it is the first, you could say, of the, the formal um, style that we know today. I mentioned before this is called Uchen, so if we go to the next, we have a very, very early form of um, Uchen here, um, quite stylized. Um, this is something that I enjoy to do for myself as a calligrapher is to, to study ancient scripts, to pick out the alphabet, write them down in the style and then create them in the style myself. And it, it has, and I'll give another example later, it has a very, what's the right word, almost kind of spooky kind of feeling when you're writing a style that was written by somebody all that time ago you kind of have a sense of that person and how they would have been at that time. You know, this is very elegant. From what I get from this, you know, they have time. It's not rushed. <laughs> so very interesting that exercise and it does help revive and understand these very early forms. So if we move on. Now, the contender for the origins of the uh, Tibetan written language are the, what we call the bumpos. So this is the pre-religion to Buddhists in, in Tibet, the bumpos. So this one is a, a script style starting at the top here. The Tibetan equivalent is below. This is the alphabet. This style is called Shangshung, Shangshung Mar Chen. Chen means the, the greater. Um, and they claim that the modern or contemporary or, or today's Uchen script derive from this. Um, I'm not so sure. There is a sort of, there's always been a bit of a debate between the, the, the Bumpos and the, and the Tibetan Buddhists, but I thought I'd throw this one in. Uh, another example of this, this uh, beautiful uh, script, very formal, and the next. And then we have their, uh, what we call their shorter hand, really. Uh, this is called Ma Chung, so the, the lesser version. Again, we have below the Tibetan equivalent from there uh, of the alphabet. It's not the complete alphabet. Um, this style here, it's called um, Druma, and it's a very early form of the cursive style, the Ume style, the headless style. So next. And here is a, a very nice uh, 
example of a manuscript written in, in the uh, Druma. Now, any of you who are calligraphers, it doesn't matter which language you, you, you write, you, know, you, you, will be, um, you will know how to wield a pen. And if you look at the characters very closely, the, the tops of each of these letters have little, almost like serifs to them. It would be quite a labor of love to, to write this. You know, it's not straightforward pen, penmanship. There's a, there's a lot of detailing in, in this. And again, it shows that they certainly had more time and they certainly have more, more of a label of, of love, or I should say a label of devotion, really, being, being a Buddhist or bumpo. So let's move on. So then just to recap then, we have the, the two last syllables of the alphabet here, uh, the syllable A, ah, which is the, said to be the essence of the, um, of all the sounds of the, the alphabet. So to put these more clearly into the categories, so Zabma here in the middle, this really translates as Zab means to be um, attentive, careful, and Ma means category. So it's the, it gives the notion of the care or, or the, how attentive one needs to be. As all um, writing styles, you need to be very focused and attentive. So then on this side is, is the class that belongs to that. So Zab Chen, so the, the greater the greater of the attentive styles. It's, it's really the uh, proper name or the original name for Uchen, which is the one below, Uchen, the, the style with head. And then it goes on here, another name for it is Yik Kar, means, Yik means letter and Kar means white. So the good letter, you know, the white letter. On this side, the cursive script, which is headless, the Ume script. So rather than Zab Chen, the great, then it's Zab Chun, the lesser, the lesser of the scripts. So the more um, writing styles, quick writing styles, rather than these letters that of the Uchen script is rather constructed rather than just written. This, there's more of a flow with these, these uh, Ume scripts on this side. Down here is actually, as I keep repeating, Ume written, the headless script. And what I've done here is actually written each of these descriptions of these different names of the different styles in their style themselves. So Uchen is written in Uchen and Ume is written in Ume. Uchen and Ume. And then we have uh, what we call Petsuk. Pet means the book. So it's the writing style for books. And the characteristic of this is that everything is much shorter. Of course, in Tibet, um, especially central Tibet and western Tibet, uh, there were very few trees. Um, paper was a, quite an expensive commodity. So if you had a manuscript to write, uh, to copy out or to write, you would choose the, the petsuk, because it's very short and squat, you can get more lines literally on your, on your paper. So very, for very practical reasons. Now these scripts are tended to be more in East Tibet and East Tibet is Kam and Amdo. So another name for this is Kamik, or so the writing style of Kam. And just to show you here, we've got the central area of Tibet. Here is Lhasa, the, the capital. Here is Kam right over here by Yunnan and um, Chengdu area. And then up here is Amdo, which is almost as big as the Tibet itself. But for Tibetans, this would all be uh, considered part of Tibet. Uh, but a bit like the Scottish, you know, the Amdos like to, to, to think they're, they have their own culture. And indeed they do, you know, the, I don't understand very much of what they talk. Uh, their dialect is, is quite, uh, strong, uh, quite different. So not only do we have these different script styles in, um, across Tibet, um, but we have um, 
the different areas that of course would have influence on these different styles. Tibet of course was, was for most parts, or modern Tibet we could say, uh, since the time of the first king and Son Sin Gampo uh, is Buddhist um, and must have been, I don't know, tens of thousands of monasteries across, across different lineages, different traditions. One monastery was, they were quite competitive in, in sort of a healthy way, health, healthily competitive. So you would get scribes who, who would sort of outdo their best calligraphy for the next monastery and all of this sort of thing. And so, of course, it developed these very different styles right across. And, and as I said, if we remember how big Europe is, and, and this is, you know, you could easily fit Spain, France, Germany, and, and quite a few other countries here, just how diverse the, the scriptural uh, traditions are in Europe. You know? So it's not surprising that there are so many. So next. Now, when Buddhism uh, came to Tibet, there was an awful lot of work to do, and it, I think it took, um, it, what didn't happen overnight, this, these here are all the, there's one side on there, these are all the manuscripts, volumes of the, um, what we call the Tenjura, the Kanjura and the Tenjura, so it's the, the Buddhist canon that's loose, loosely described, um, I can't remember how many, 225 volumes of the Kanjura, and then the Tenjur and then the Kanjura, the commentaries to that, that's a lot. Even most of this, even today, hasn't been uh, translated into English. You know, it, would take, it would take an army of translators, you know, a lifetime or two to translate everything. Um, so incredible to think that the, the complete teachings of the Buddhas, that the Buddha's teachings are contained within this, that all the tantras, uh, or the sutras uh, that were translated into Tibet. Um, and most wealthy monasteries would have the complete set. It was um, uh, objects of veneration. It, it usually sat either side of the Buddha images that you, you respect. And, and because it is the encompasses the Buddha's teachings, the Dharma, which is, um, as they say, the, the truth. So next. So these were very beautifully written uh, using real gold. This is the beginning pages here. I'm not quite sure why this is up here. This is, this is actually looks to me like Pali from um, Burma or somewhere like that. Um, but this is definitely Tibetan. So these are really, you could call these first pages of these manuscripts uh, illuminated with these beautiful um, paintings. Uh, covered of these silk cloths to, to protect them. And so again, it was uh, really a, a labor of devotion to hand write these hundreds of volumes, again, by an army of, of scribes uh, using gold ink uh, on this very particular uh, paper. We'll get to the materials later. Other than writing them all out, very early on in Tibet, they used uh, woodblock prints to print all of these. This is probably more recognizable for most of us as, as Tibetan scripts. It's the Uchen script here uh, and written, uh, carved, and of course everything's carved backwards to, to print. <laughs> um, this is the A side and the B side of the paper. You can tell by this, this water, this stain. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, for your information, the A side of any, any um, page always has this, what we call this heading character here. It, its role is to say it starts here, really. It's rather like the role of a musical clef, in, you know, for a musical score. It, it's not a word itself, is it? it, it it's a sign that it's, this is where it starts. And the B side never has it, has this sign, start. So even if you, if you accidentally dropped your loose leaf book of you know, 500 pages and you had to put them all back together again, you have the page numbers at the end and you know the A and B side. Next. So here is one of the woodblock prints, 
can carve backwards. And so if we're talking about the hundreds of volumes with hundreds of pages each, how many wood blocks? Huge buildings. Next. And the, one of the most famous um, buildings for the printing house really is in Cam, uh, in an area called Degi. This is known as Degi Pakang, which means the Degi um, printing house. Uh, it, it's still in operation today and still prints. And it does actually um, lend, it does actually influence back to the writing style as well. And this will go into, so if we move on. So this is another very early form of Uchen, giving the grid of the proportion of the letters. Uchen really is, is based on a proportion guidelines. Of course, you need straight lines to, to write straight lines of uh, writing. This one here um, comes about 710. 790, sorry, um, and by somebody called uh, a calligrapher, a scribe, a scholar, Kawa Palsang Lotsawa. And so it's, it's known as the Kawa Palsang Lotsawa script. And he was a, a translator of many of the Buddhist canons, the Buddhist manuscripts that came from India. Um, but this would have been based on the original um, foundation that Tommy Sambuta um, set out. So next. Now we're getting more specific here. With the Uchen script, which is written here, it says Tibetan Uchen, there are generally two main areas uh, that are practiced today. This one, as you see, is slightly shorter. It's, we're comparing the two styles. This one on this side is actually from um, Degi. It's the, so it's called Dechi, Tri means the right. It has a slightly more longer, elegant uh, writing style. This one's slightly shorter. This style comes from a famous scribe, um, Chungti uh, Chongse. So, Chung Tri, it's known as perhaps the foundation for many of the contemporary or met styles that are used today, even fonts. We'll get to fonts later. Now, this is Uchen, but this is the Uchen style that belongs to Bhutan. Differs again, it differs in the proportions, the proportion of the actual letters stylized, a little different. Uh, they have a, a slightly different writing style. And the next one. So this is the um, Chung Tree, the, the most common one. Uh, a little, a few words here to, to give you the idea of, of how it is. This, the, the main root of the letter, we say, the main body of the letter, which occupies the top. And then occasionally some of the letters have this leg that comes right the way down to the bottom. So this occupies three units. Um, one of these units is made of two widths, two widths of the pen nib. So that's how you determine, of course, the right size letter to the right size pen width that you're using, which again, any English or European calligraphy stars uses this. If we go back uh, with the uh, Bhutanese style, you can see they use two, not three. And so that it has a different style because they're hanging these curved, which we, um, which we call shoulders or arms of the letters from that. So we go forward and then forward again, here is an example, one leaf of a manuscript that has been written in gold. It's actually gold powder that's, that's ground up and mixed uh, with a little bit of uh, gum Arabic, just to give it some stability. And this is uh, 
more the chung tree uh, style, the shorter style. You can see we have here five rows high. There's the heading character as well, and really quite kind of squashed up to enable to, to get as much on, on there. Uh, the paper is um, colored with indigo, and then this, this middle section here is actually polished with a stone, so it becomes smooth and shiny, and it gives a really nice foundation for the gold to sit. And of course, we know what gold's like. Whatever the gold sits on will um, reflect the, the surface. So if it's a shiny surface sits on, the gold's going to shine. If it's an absorbent surface, of course, the gold looks more dull. Next, please. So this is the uh, style from, the, from Degi, which is longer. I put an extra line in there to, to compare to the other style, much more elegant, much more longer. So this is the uh, alphabet again. And moving forward. And here is uh, an example of the Detri, uh, which is uh, quite elegant in, in style, thinner in style. The heading uh, page here. After the heading page, the illuminated head, then it's, it'll be more like ordinary as this. So let's move on. Now this is, this is an artwork that I created some years ago, really to give um, breakdown from the, the origins of uh, the, the Buddhist language that here is in the Lansa Sanskrit. This says, Nama Buddhaya, Nama Dhamaya, Nama Sangaya, which is the three jewels, known as the three jewels. So, homage, Namo is homage to the Buddha, to the Dharma, the Buddhist teaching, and the Sangha, those enlightened beings who, who help us, uh, who are, the, you could say, the monks, uh, the lamas, the teachers. And then down here is the translation of that in um, Tibetan Petsuk, the short um, style. And then bringing it right to this day and age, my attempt at a bit of uh, um, some nice, what I thought was nice English that would complement <laughs> that, um, uh, some Celtic, then uh, homage to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. So you've really got some evolution going through um, from the, the time of India to Tibet to us here. So let's move on. Uh, and indeed, I'm talking about the language, the written language in Tibet. It's, it's only really, um, very fortunately, in recent years that there has been more of a... Um, uptake in writing again. It was a, a writing system that was feared to, to be lost. Um, it's, it was on the, the world, UNESCO's World um, Endangered Languages. Um, but somehow in Tibet, they managed to organize themselves. There became more interest. And they've announced uh, one day a year as, as in their National Calligraphy Day, which is on the um, 30th, of, uh, 30th of April each year. Why the 30th of April? Because there's 30 letters of the, the Tibetan alphabet and there's four vowel signs, so the fourth month. And so monks um, are obviously producing these very impressive long sc scrolls. Um, it's very encouraging to see uh, that they're, they're really reviving you know, um, this wonderful uh, tradition. So let's, let's move on. So we're going to go through now in more detail some of the other scripts. Uh, so this is the, all of these are the Ume styles. You can see there's a great variation there, these written styles. Um, this is the very early one that we looked at earlier with the little um, Juma, with the little uh, serifs on the top. 
And then we have this uh, other category over here. which is much more cursive, much more of the cursive styles. You can see it's a quicker writing size. In, in fact, these are called quick writing, whereas these are much more uh, composed. The first of this, this category, the drummer, is as written here, suk ring. Ring means long. And as you can see, the character of these letters is that have very long, um, legs, very long tails. And then there's a shorter version called Tsuk Tung. Tung means, or oh, this is Drup. Um, here's Suk Tung, which is a shorter, shorter version. And normally as, as one learns, and I, I will come on to this, one learns the um, order of these letters. There's a very specific order to, to learn. You start learning when you're a young monk or nun. And you would learn these longer versions, the Sukring versions first, really to, um, to master control of your arm, your hands, and, and the pen. Because as you, any of you calligraphers would know, to, to pull a long vertical line downwards, nice and straight and even, really tests any slight wobble or doubt or anything is shown, isn't it? So this really um, teaches you to control the hand. Down here then, the last one is the whole area of the, the drupsa, we'll, we'll come into more detail of the drupsa. Drupsa is very much the artistic or, or uh, freestyle. You can say it is less formal in these sukring styles. And then over here, um, we have the, what we call the between, batri means the between styles, which is not quite fully cursive, uh, and, and, but more so, less formal than this. Um, and then the, the final one down here, which is really the, the quick handwriting. I, I always joke, if, if you're going to get a, um, a doctor's prescription in Tibet, it, it would be written in this one. <laughs> Nobody could understand. It's actually very difficult to read. Okay, so let's move on. So this is a, an artwork that I created to illustrate the um, Tsuk Ring, very uniformed, a little difficult to read, even if you read Tibetan, because you know there are bumper to bumper next to each other it's difficult to distinguish which is the letter which is a separating line which letter the vowel sign belongs to because they all sort of swoop over one side um, this is verses from the dharma parlor uh, first verse of the dharma parlor um, and playfully here I, I put this horse running away the letters falling off the end of the, the cart Okay, so then the Tsuk Tung here, different proportions. Here's the alphabet, a little shorter in style. Once you've learned the Suk Ring, you can move to the Suk Tung. Once you've learned the Suk Tung, then you can move to the next style. So move on, which is even shorter. This is a, a piece I did, much shorter, much more squat. And again, move on. And then here we have the, the book writing style that we talked about before, the Petsuk. You can see here, very short, uh, uniformed, very squat. Let's move on. Another example of the Petsuk. Uh, here I'm, I'm writing on a, what we call in, in Bhutan, it's called desho paper. It's uh, what was used in Tibet as well. It's, it's made from the bark of a tree that grows very high in the Himalayas. It's a very stringent, um, toxic actually. You have to soak the bark in shreds in water for a long time and rinse it and all the rest. But the great advantage of paper made in that, two, two great advantages is because it's so fibrous, very difficult to tear. It's very strong, very robust. 
and your bookworm, any insects won't eat it because it's toxic. So manuscripts written on this paper will literally last for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then we have the between, um, between style. So we say sukma chuk. So it's neither that or neither this. It's the betweeny style. Uh, a little quote there, the fallible truth of karma and cause and effect. And um, that's how it's translated there. So you can see as we're coming closer to the quicker styles, it's becoming much more cursive and, and loose. And then this is what we call chuk means the quick or swift style, a handwriting style. Uh, the alphabet here, and here is the alphabet again with the vowel signs attached to each of the letters. Okay, let's move on. Then this really illustrates uh, uh, the different styles Putting them together in, in a row, you've got the whole alphabet going, well, nearly all, all of the alphabet going right across the top. We have the Uchen with all the vowel signs. We have the um, Drupsa, the more cursive style below, and Sukma Chuk or Suk Tung below here, and then the Chuk, the quick style, right at the bottom. Now, all of these are the same letters and the same vowel signs, so you can see the, the huge variety and, and difference between them all. And next, and again, the, the quick styles, you can see they get quicker and quicker. I think it gives the name down here. Dutsa, yeah, Chuktri, it gives all the, the different styles. And now we come on to the uh, more decorative scripts, the Dutsa. And the Drupsa class itself, there's many different divisions. Um, historically, they've changed through time and um, between monasteries um, across different uh, regions of Tibet. So there's, there's many different styles of this. If we go on to the next one, there's another style. You can see this is a bit more angular. And if we move on again, quite different, but all in the same. Uh, class of writing. Uh, next, uh, another more contemporary, uh, it's more practice in this day and age uh, of the Drupsa. Quite a bit more stylized. Now, this is a much, much earlier version. Uh, again, interests me greatly. I, I personally, I think it's very um, elegant, of course, because of the exaggeration of the long tails of the, the letters against this, this very small, uniform body of the letters. And it gives a very nice effect. This, this style here is used really to write formal letters. You know, if you had a creed or some important documents, announcements, the new name of the Dalai Lama or, you know, the property belonging to the Potala Palace or something like that. It will be written in this, uh, this script. Uh, this is quite an early one. Uh, this very famous scroll, it's awfully long. It's an account really, as it says here. It's an account of these uh, miracles, which is called the universal salvation. And so it's the relationship between the fifth Karmapa and the um, Yongli emperor. I think that's the Ming, Ming period. Um, there's always been this relationship between the emperors of China and the, the Tibetan masters. They, the, the, um, for the emperors, the Tibetan masters were quite often their guru, you could say and they would invite them to China. And this account here is when the fifth Karmapa uh, stayed in, in this, his palace, these great miracles uh, happened, rainbow clouds, and it's a huge long documentary of, of this, uh, this amazing event. But what interests as far as the scripts concerned is how many different languages that I've written down here 
are being used to, to document that. And it, it really does give the, the sense of just how far their influence went. You've got traditional Mongolian here. You've got the Tibetan Drubso, which we've been um, talking about. This I can't really pronounce. Uh, I've seen it written many different times, but this is really um, a script style from um, north of Tibet uh, towards Buryata. You even have Arabic and Chinese. Now, of course, Tibet is smack bang middle of the Silk Route. So in a way, it's not surprising there are so many uh, contributing languages you know, to this uh, scroll. My teacher, um, Tibetan teacher, one of my teachers lived in Kham. And when he first as, uh, came to this country, he was very excited um, because he'd heard uh, in Tibet when he was a child, the best robes were made out of Harris tweed, which occasionally used to make its way along the Silk Route all the way from Scotland. So he was rather excited that he was in Great Britain. He's been able to get his hands on some, some Harris tweed. But he did say that the quality wasn't quite as good as it was back then. So next. So as I mentioned before, one of the things that I do enjoy doing is analyzing. So uh, a calligraphy style from a long time ago, um, it's 13th century uh, of these Nanjing scrolls. And here I've, it's a very sort of rough notes, but I'm, I'm actually picking through the, what the original scribe has written and pulled out all the letters of the alphabet and, and all the subjoined letters and subscribed letters, et cetera, really to, um, to compose. So the next, this is the notes. And then the next one here, I've sort of smartened things up and formalized it. Very beautiful. And you, you really get the sense, you really get under the skin of the, the artist who originally wrote this. And then from this, I created this um, piece here of the, the four immeasurable states it's called um, love, compassion. Uh, we've got the last one is equanimity uh, and joy. So that's a, a study piece, you could say. Now, I mentioned right on early in, in the, um, to begin with, um, this Pagpa script. Pagpa, very interesting style. This is a style that came about at the time of Genghis Khan, who at the time ruled, of course, he had a huge empire as, as far as Constantinople. Um, and of course, Tibet itself. Um, he, he instructed this style to be created um, by one of his um, contemporaries called uh, Pax, Paxpa, so it's called the Pakpa script. It's a script style that relates to Mongolian. As you can see, it's, it's vertical, but it also relates to Tibetan. To read the script, you, you really need to know Tibetan. Um, it fell in the decline. It, it was last used, um, strangely enough, on Christian gravestones in China. That's when it was last <laughs> used. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, there is a modern version. When I say modern, this is still quite a few hundred years old. Um, this is the same style called Horyik. Hor means um, Mongolia, and Yik is the means writing style. You you have two versions here. They differ slightly in styles. You have the red is the Tibetan equivalent of each of these letters which is written vertically, vertically as such. And this is used for, it's a seal script. It kind of mimics, if you like, the labyrinth of Chinese seal script for seals. And as at the time, um, Genghis Khan was ruled across, right across into China, then this style was used to, for their official seals. 
kind of authoritarian looking script. Um, it has a, a, a different uh, grammatical or letter construct. Um, it's somewhat, it's somewhat lost. There, there seems to be an awful lot of variation uh, with this particular style. So again, this is a, a practice piece here. This really brings me to the next part of the, the talk, uh, is the tools that we use. We've talked about the paper. So traditionally in, in Tibet, bamboo pens were the, the choice. Bamboo, particular types of bamboo were used for different, different functions, different um, pen types. Some bamboo is softer, more elastic, you know, bendy. Some is much harder. Um, in more it, it, recent times in, in Tibet, the Chinese umbrellas were greatly sought after for pens because Chinese umbrellas are made out of lots of slats of bamboo conveniently cut, already cut for you. But if it was a bamboo pen, that, um, bamboo umbrella that was a hundred years or more, the bamboo would be guaranteed to be really hard. So you'd keep a good edge <laughs> to your nib. When I first learned, one of my teachers um, I learned from was, was in, up in Dharamsala. And um, he taught me how to make the bamboo pen. And he literally just jumped up, ran into the garden, cut a piece of bamboo, came in and then just cut away. So these are his pens that he, he brought in from the garden. I kept as a, a relic. Um, you can see here the writing, there's the very formalized drupsa, again to very formal grid sections. Um, and then the uchen as well. They do say that the Uchen is based on a sacred um, foundation. It, it is actually based on the grid of nine because it's three sections up. And for each letter, it's three sections uh, across. Same for Chinese, uh, a grid of nine, which is, of course, according to Feng Shui, is the divine number. And then there's a practice of some sukring um, down below. So how do you then practice Tibetan? As I said before, paper was a very expensive commodity. If we move to the next slide, what was used is pieces of board, piece, flat pieces of wood. That's called a yangshin, and they're blackened and they're dusted with, if you're lucky to have chalk or you know, uh, white, more white earth, dusted with that. And then the, the letters are practiced writing into the, into the dust. Um, and the, the construction lines are applied, sometimes scratched in the wood. We have a bag here, rather like a pounce, that has chalk inside it, this, and this leather, with a little hole, and so you pull the string through to powder your chalk, a bit like a plum, plumber's line or you know builder's line, and then you'd pull it taut and snap it down, and it would leave these these lines. If we go to the next, now what we write with in the traditional way, this this was actually with a group of uh, Bhutanese um, calligraphers who were sharing very nicely sharing their, all their trade secrets. This is um, a substance that is made from rice and it's cooked down. You can see burnt basically. And so strained here, it makes this very kind of thick sticky ink that's used on here. He, he actually uses this particular type of bamboo pen, wipes the excess on his thumb there and then draws into this. Now, the great thing about this practice using this uh, wooden slate is that, of course, when you've filled it up and your teachers come around and praise you or either tugged your ear because it's not good enough, then you can wipe it clean and start all over again. 
right? In this day and age, it's what we should all be doing. And here is uh, the pen that's used for this particular type of lighter. It's more like a reed really than bamboo uh, for this purpose. And any calligrapher would have their, their knife. There's a knife sheath there and a little piece of wood that you cut the pen onto. The other end of the pen is, comes to a fine point, and this is used to sometimes scratch out lines, scratch your head with. And here's a, a full range of, of the pens, different pens. This one here is the actual bamboo itself. So you can see, if we move on to the next slide, we can see here, right down here, the knot in the bamboo becomes the, the featured part of the pen. You can see literally it's exactly the same height. So that pen is made from a piece of wood like that. Now the ink kept in these lovely bronze pots. Uh, the ink is, is made uh, much like Sumi ink, where the, the best quality of black is collected from the soot, the finest soot. You know when we have a candle at home and, um, and you have these plumes of soot at the, at the end of the, which makes smoke, we don't like it. And when we try and take it off, mixed with the oils, it's very difficult to get off the fingers. I mean, that makes superb um, black for the ink. It's mixed uh, with a bit of water. Uh, camphor is quite often mixed in there. It gives a very um, particular smell. Of course, that gives it longevity. Um, if you want your ink to be, um, to have a nice gloss to it, a nice shine to it, you'd use a little bit of oil of sandalwood, which would give a nice pleasant smell as well, of course. Um, and in Tibet, of course, very, very cold. If you want to prevent your ink from freezing, let, let alone your fingers, um, you'd put a little bit of ylang-ylang in there, like a, a ginger-based uh, spice to stop it from freezing. Uh, here's more bamboo pens and these copper pots. Okay, let's move on. So this was, um, I had a, uh, I can't really call it a job because it was such a, a pleasure, but um, before the pandemic, I'd been invited to Bhutan. Um, it's kind of a, a bit of a long story really, but um, visiting there, if, one time I, I met somebody who was very much um, concerned about the conservation of the arts and culture in, and in Bhutan. And I said to her, well, next time I come to Bhutan, I'd, I'd love to meet one of your calligraphy masters because I'd love to learn something you know, from them. And so the next year I, I turned up and I says, well, have, you know, have you found a nice calligraphy master? To, I, I expected that would be quite a, an easy thing. And she said, uh, 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 we can't really find any like that. And we've realized um, that we, we stopped teaching traditional calligraphy in the school, the monastic, monastic curriculum during the 80s, that actually stopped. So that's a, quite a long time. So none of the younger people were learning. And so there was a bit of a panic went round and they did in the end manage to winkle these real masters of calligraphy, especially this gentleman, he's a layer man, these are monks who originally learned new calligraphy and that they were brought together um, by the monastic body. And we had this amazing brainstorm with these old manuscripts of uh, calligraphy manuscripts based on Uchen, although it is Bhutanese, uh, in order to um, pull together. And then subsequently the, these masters wrote new instruction manuals and implicated that right across Bhutan. And now it's been reestablished in their curriculum. Um, so rather nice to be just a little part of that. And interestingly enough, during this, um, this lovely meeting, 
uh, of like minds, you could say. Even though we spoke different languages, we spoke the same language as far as pens and ink and writing and everything. And um, we, amongst these, we discovered I discovered this one manuscript, which is written in Ume here, the the headless script, which is actually very uncommon in Bhutan. It's mostly Uchen is, is written or what they call Zonka or Zabma. And to my delight, it actually describes each of the letters of the alphabet, the Sanskrit alphabet, um, giving them each of the letters, the name of a Bodhisattva. Now, if anyone knows about Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, a Bodhisattva is a being who is here to help us or to enlightenments before their own enlightenment. Um, the reason why each of the letters of the alphabet is allocated to a different bodhisattva is because, because the Tibetan language very much evolved as a vehicle to preserve and to communicate the Buddha's teaching, then each of the letters is considered very sacred as if it's a bodhisattva. And I've heard this for a long time. So actually to see um, a manuscript that actually lists each of the names for these different uh, letters was, was very exciting. And I, I'm um, in the process of getting this properly uh, translated. So here we are, more of us investigating. Now, I was given the job also to, um, to train some of their monks. And so one of the one of the things that to help inspire them really, very young monks, is that I took them to this project in Bhutan. Um, the, I think it's the king's father had sponsored the whole of the Buddhist canon, all these hundreds of volumes to be, as I uh, said before, to be written in gold on parchments here. And here they are, a whole army of, of uh, not all monks, it's taken them quite, it's taken them several years so far and they've still got a way to go. Uh, if you move to the next stage. So here they are preparing the original polished uh, leaves on this special paper. Here's somebody head down. He has the, the pure gold ink on the end of a brush that he'd bring the nib to the brush and then apply it here. He's copying from this original manuscript here. Here's a tip for us. If we're ever copying something, cut a little paper window and you're copying just the window so your eye doesn't wander to the wrong, the wrong sentence and uh, we, we start to mess up. So if we move on. If we do mess up, then there's someone in the team with a scratch out tool, little carry shell there to repolish and here's a correction that's painted back in. Uh, next. These are manuscripts that are being produced in Tibet currently. Really encouraging again to, to see this. Of course, many of these ancient manuscripts uh, so beautifully illuminated uh, were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So it's very encouraging again to see this, these ancient traditions uh, alive and kicking and, and you know, the work still uh, moving on. So next, so back to ordinary me after these very beautiful posh manuscripts. This is a demonstration I'm giving. Now Tibetans wouldn't use flat brushes like this, but um, they can be used of course to, to write Uchen. Uh, there's a slight different technique. It really allows to write very large. I, I use a brush for larger artworks. Um, and this, I'm writing one word really to, uh, as an example. A tasty Darjeeling tea. 
is thanks to fresh butter. A little saying from Tibet, Tibetans love to drink their tea with butter. And I quite agree, has anyone tried to drink Tibetan tea? If the butter's off, it is revolting. It would give you an instant sore throat, you know, because we ancient the bit. But if it's fresh and it's churned nicely, it's, it's, it's almost like a soup. They put a pinch of salt in there as well. Very nourishing, keeps, keeps, keeps the army of monks in Tibet warm. You know, the butter, they, then they'd rub the butter all over their face. It's a really good ins insulator. But Darjeeling, this really brings it right back to the beginning, beginning again. How close, really, the Tibetan language is to our own British culture. This word that I cal calligraphed here with a brush in Tibetan says, Dorji Ling. If you add your English vowel signs to that, it becomes Da Ji Ling. Now, Dorji Ling is a place, of course, we know Da Ji Ling, where the tea comes from. So our forefathers, and probably quite a few of these guys on the walls around here, probably enjoyed a cup of Darjeeling. And they didn't know they were saying a Tibetan name. So I thought that was rather, rather nice uh, way to, to round up um, bringing it to, to home. Okay. Yeah, Tibet, that's correct. Tibetan reads from left to right. You're encouraged from a young age to use your right hand. It, it's um, a writing system that's completely unforgiven for left-handers. Um, I do teach uh, Tibetan calligraphy uh, around the world, uh, workshops, and, and it's very difficult for left-handers. In fact, so difficult, it's just the way that the lines are pulled and pushed and, and formed. Um, we have, they have more success that using their, their right hand that they've not used all their life because it just goes against using a, a left hand. But it, yes, you're correct, it's same as English. Hmm. Yes. Is there any knowledge of where that tradition of Well, as I, as I said, this very strong um, horizontal line that the letters fall down from directly relates to the, the original Sanskrit. Where that started, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. But it, in a sense, it's it's a perhaps perhaps it's a, a perhaps consider, consideration because you're writing down you're never pushing your hand over what you've just written, which is the problem with someone using their left hand to write. You know you, you're smudging your the work you've done, and so hanging the letter down has that sense. You know you're finishing off down all, all the time. Perhaps that I don't know. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. The so you're asking what the name of the the, the tree is for the, for the paper. Um, I don't remember the name, I th and I think the name differs. It's a tree that does grow very quite high up not above the tree line. It's more of a shrub, really. It's a very small tree. It, it is related to, I can't remember, something like cashew or something like that. And it's, it, um, yes, it has this very toxic bark, 
very typical for the Himalayas. I don't know the botanical name, I should do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tell us when and how, when, how, and how long you will do this one. Oh, yeah. So they're asking when and how long, how and how long. It's quite a big question. I was a Buddhist monk. How? I don't know, really. How long I was, <laughs> how long I was a Buddhist monk was actually with my precepts was uh, 18 years, 18 or 19 years, something like that. Um, and based in, in uh, one of the first Tibetan Buddhist uh, monasteries, you could say, or Buddhist centers up in Scotland. Um, we had Tibetan lamas there that, that we learned from. Although I started learning Tibetan myself when I was an early teenage boy. Okay, so asking if I can share any book reference showing these scripts. There's not one book that I know of, apart from some publications that come from Tibet itself or China that have everything together. Um, yeah, I mean, one of my passions is to collect manuscripts and, and instruction manuals, really, from, from all over. But as, as I talked about, the, um, you can see there's a vast variety of scripts so it'd be, it'd be quite in a big volume or a couple of volumes. Um, I do, it's, perhaps it's a good time to, to say, um, I am in the pipeline, uh, produce, will be producing um, a book on the Uchen script, how to write it, it'd be an instruction manual, um, but more currently, and it's only just been launched, uh, anybody can join anytime or subscribe, um, we've formed with Wisdom Publications, which is based in America. Wisdom Publications are due for their online academy, their online wisdom experience is called, you can look online. Um, you can follow an eight week course with videos and illustrations that we put together with myself teaching. The beauty of this is anyone can join from anywhere in the world at any time at their own pace, which is the, you know, pretty wonderful thing, really. Yes. Uh, next one is, uh, do you have the scripts of the, any hue regarding the separation of the syllables? Any hue? Hue. I mean, the way that the, so the question is if, what was the question again? Do the, Umes, the headless scripts offer any hue regarding the hue, hue. hint, hint of separation. Yeah, the, the, Umi, the Umi script is more difficult to separate, that's for sure. Um, I think the hint there is really only to a trained eye. It, it's something that's if, if you see it for the first time, it just looks like this mass of com confused lines. You don't know where one letter starts and stops or, you know, a word is grouped together. Um, but to a trained eye, yes, there are particular uh, lines. There's a line called a, um, a, a tzak, which is in the uchen is a dot, as you can see there. That separates the letters or the words. So doji ling, you could say, doji is, is two syllables, and then ling is one word, and you can see they're dotted, separated with a dot. But the ume script, they're separated with a longer line that comes to the full height of the letters. That's the stylistic difference. So in, in English and European languages, words and letters are separated with a gap, aren't they? In Tibetan, Sanskrit-based, they're separated with a line or a dot. Uh, one from Shamir, one from 
Yeah, there's yeah. If, if there's any written evidence of the um, pre Sambuta Bumpo script, um, pre and Sambuta, there was a written language for sure. But as I explained, it was soon found to be inadequate. This is what the Buddhists say. Um, any examples really that we see now are examples of the Bumpo scripts that have evolved since that time. So they've become much more sophisticated, parallel to the Buddhist um, script styles. So it's very, very difficult to say. There's no real evidence uh, of this. It, it, it is, as I began the talk, quite a vague area, really, the, the, the paid you know, the, um, yeah, the history of the, how the language developed. On that note, I have one for myself. Yes. Which is, uh, can you show this period? Yes. They're using the card in practice, yeah? In, in what? In practice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as the sort of language people are in Sanskrit or uh, Brahman, uh, did practice have any influence on the So the pillar of Ashoka, the, which is called the Pratic uh, letters mm, or style, if that had an influence on the Tibetan. What date is the Ashoka's? It's very early on, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, first thing yeah. yeah, probably. It's difficult to know. It's sort of to the dust of time. Yeah. Um, I know that Sambuta, when he was sent to India, it said in the scriptures, it said that he, he learnt from one particular master, he had to offer gold, you know, to receive this. And from this Indian um, scriptural master, he learnt not just one, but, but several, I think 12 different styles. So it could have been, who knows, it could have been included. Yes. Um, I know that in, in a lot of uh, sort of Chinese East Asian traditions and, and in Arabic script as well, very highly developed aesthetic, visual aesthetic. Um, uh, it looks very varied and highly developed. I wonder whether there's anything equivalent in, in Tibetan of um, developing the letter forms and uh, you know the way that it is written. Any sort of sense of mm. or like that. So, you're asking if there's a, an equivalent, Tibetan equivalent of artistic expression of the letter forms, which is found in Chinese uh, and other uh, Arabic uh, um, letter styles. Now, of course, Arabic, um, because of their, their faith, they're not supposed to represent any figurative so all their focus went into the, the to to develop a very sophisticated and beautiful uh, writing styles and of course uh with chinese and more especially uh the japanese uh, calligraphy styles became a practice uh as as much like zen expression poetry uh, it's all within the, the visual, how it looks. Tibetan is a little bit different. Um, it didn't really develop it commonly. It did, there, was, there was that um, free expression, more really by a few um, highly accomplished incarnate lamas. Um, but there was not the infrastructure in old Tibet. There weren't galleries and artists and, and all that sort of thing. Really everything was produced 
as a labor of devotion. So the, the scriptures that I, I explained, you know, were copied out as, as neatly and as, and as beautifully as possible. It was frowned upon, you could say, um, if there was any self sort of expression within that, it's that, then that becomes an extension of the ego. And of course, in Buddhism, we are trying to um, tame the mind of, of that. So it's very different. It, it's only in recent times with um, Tibetan lamas such as uh, Chojan Trungpa, who established uh, Tibetan Buddhism in America, and he very, very skillfully united uh, Tibetan calligraphy with the art of Zen calligraphy, and so things became expressive. He's, I mean, he's definitely influenced my work as as uh, as uh, oh, and a Westerner with an ego. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, an artist needs to have some sort of ego. Hopefully it's not too uh, arrogant or, but it, you know, it's definitely, so that there is a later development with, with that and, and it's become much more popular uh, uh, as an art form. Tibetan is, is now developing in the way that you asked. Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that each letter of the alphabet is correlated to a Buddhist chapter. That is quite profound. Can you say more about this? And let us know if there's any way we can know about the relationship between the letters and the Buddhist chapter. Yeah. Well, um, so, asking about the relationship between this, this profound relationship between the uh, letters, the 30 letters of the Tibetan alphabet to allocated to each of the different bodhisattvas. As um, I've not seen anything translated as yet. So this is why I was particularly excited to find this one particular manuscript that, that's, that uh, did talk about this. So I can't really say much more about any more detail about which bodhisattva, etc. cetera, uh, it's allocated. It's still yet to be um, revealed, I think. But for me, what it's, it's saying really is just the overall respect and veneration of a language which is definitely sacred. You know, it's, it's definitely joining in the heaven to earth. It's definitely a language that has, a written language, a discipline that has evolved really to transmit and communicate the wisdoms of, of Buddha Dharma. So in that respect, it's um, a very sacred language. I mean, you could say, dare I say, you know, the English language hasn't particularly evolved for the same reasons. It's evolved for law, commerce, you know, trade, business. It doesn't quite have the same, generally I'm saying, because there is room for a sacred communication within the language, but it didn't develop for those reasons. Whereas Tibetan definitely did. It's very much based on that foundation of, of Buddha Dharma. Yes. And, um, this one is about the ancient woodblock, um, showing the scripts to be justified in their application. Is this cool? Because some characters have found heaven and earth. With a wood block, if they if the character expands better than others, the wood block print. Yeah, what what they do the, the way they do this is it's uh, quite simple, and it, it's the same for Japanese wood block prints, not necessarily the, the language, um, but it, it's is written on paper or printed on paper, and then it's glued onto the wood upside down, the ink shows through, and you carve away backwards to the paper. That's how it's done. So that's how it's justified. Uh, one last one, uh, actually two. Much of the text seems to be in the new chair. 
And yet I believe you mentioned the monks don't start learning this in calligraphy for the first time with other script. Uh, why, why is it if the manuscripts are written in each other? Yeah, the, the why um, why is it that Uchen is generally learnt last after Ume in, in the progression of learning? Um, Uchen really is the, the classical script. It also is a script that takes a long, long, much longer to construct. It's, it's a writing style that doesn't flow. You, you, you literally have to sort of break each letter down. I think the equivalent would be um, Roman. You know, Roman letters are very much constructed, aren't they? Even the angle of the serif is very precise. It's based on a grid. It's based... And you, you don't quickly write Romanesque, do you? You have to build it. And it's the same for Uchen. So Uchen is reserved really for the sacred and the classical um, scripts. So practically then it's more useful for the average everyday Tibetan to use a cursive script, which is the handwriting scripts. And that's the reason why Uchen is learnt last. Now, for us in the West, we're actually presented, many um, Tibetan Buddhists, or Western Tibetan Buddhists are more familiar with the Uchen script because that's what's more commonly presented. The reason for that is, is that Uchen actually is the most practical to make a typeface. And the first typewriters um, were put together in Bhutan, actually. The first newspapers printed in Uchen are in Bhutan. If you still go to Bhutan, the road signs are all in Uchen or Zonka, as they, they call. Um, so we're presented with Uchen, and that's our most common script side that we associate with Tibetan. Actually, for Tibetans, it's Ume, and the Uchen is, is generally learnt last. Uh, I'm actually going to ask you mentioned some scripts are. Okay, so the importance, how important is the use of Tibetan Sanskrit? In mantras, yeah. It's a good, it's a good question. So the, the reason why the Lansa and Sanskrit is honored in the Tibetan writing system is because it's an honor to its origins. Now mantras originate in India Many of the mantras, not all, but many of the mantras come from the teachings of the Buddhas within the sutras and the particular practices. Mantras are sacred words that are, are not mundane words. There's a great depth of meaning with them. Um, they represent, they embody the qualities of Buddhist wisdoms or bodhisattvas, etc. Um, and so when we, a Tibetan Buddhist is doing a practice of a particular deity or a Buddha, they would say a particular associated mantra, it should sound like the original Sanskrit. So Tibetan mantras or mantras that are written in Tibetan is actually Tibetan phonetics of the Sanskrit. Yeah, that's what it is. So Omani Pemihung or Omani Padmihung is actually originally Sanskrit, but written in phonetics. So all Tibetans can, can read it. The Lanza Sanskrit, the actual Lanza we, we showed that I showed you this earlier, is used sometimes to uh, as the heading page of particular manuscripts. Again, it's a it's a nod or a bow to its origins in that in that way. Um, and then you can get much more deeper into this and much more esoteric, of course, if that's the right word, when we, when as a practice you're doing particular visualizations of seed syllables and the way the mantra turns around and the, invokes the blessing and all this sort of thing, 
Um, to be puritanical, you do that in, in Lamsa Sanskrit because it's, it's the most directly connected to the origin of the Buddha's teaching and the practices. But again, the um, Uchen script is the best to illustrate that. It's the clearest for the visualization. Okay. One, One more. Two more. Two more. Okay. One. One. Okay. <laughs> The last one's a good one. So this is a quick one. How does hyphenated work in Hyphenated? Hyphenated. Hibernations. Hyphenated. Oh, hyphens yeah. as an accents and things yeah. like that. There are, I mean, it's a different system, of course. There are hyphens. I suppose you can call the vowel signs as hyphens. Again, when it does relate to the Sanskrit, Sanskrit alphabet is a, a lot deeper, uh, a lot more varied, you could say. So sometimes there are particular hyphens used within Tibetan to, um, to give the right sound quality in relation to Sanskrit, especially for the mantras. Yep, and the last one. So the question is if I think that the Tibetan written language is still evolving, and then? What do you think lies in store for this book, especially with modern psychology trying to be widely available? Yeah, so what's, and then what's in store for these scripts with the modern tools available? Um, I think that's, I'm more of a traditionalist. I'm, I'm trying here to sort of, preserve and, and keeping um, Tibetan alive. I was approached by what is what it, he's called Mr. Mr. Calligraphy of, of Apple Mac. I can't remember his name. Um, and I was invited to build fonts for, for, for Apple many years ago. Um, I refused because I didn't want to spend all day sitting in front of a computer. And it's, it's something like an average font takes something like 2000 hours to build. And actually, why do I want to do that when I want to endorse and keep the written tradition alive? Because all around the world, of course, every written language is, is in threat. It's under threats, you know, the written tradition. Of course, in, we, we know that in recent years, there's been a bit more of an emergence with handwriting again, which is fabulous. I do, I am aware of younger Tibetans who, who you know, they're pretty techie savvy now, and they, they are, um, a few in, individuals I know, they are creating new, exciting, modern fonts of Tibetan, which is lovely, which is really great. It's, it, it, it's good, and it, bring, it brings Tibetan as a written language in, into the 21st century, which I think is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, well done for uh, answering all those questions. Uh, and thank you so much for, for sharing uh, your very extraordinary knowledge of such a, a subtle and, and sophisticated uh, and very, very varied subject. Um, I did find myself uh, thinking uh, earlier on that uh, the 17 years that I claimed you were in a, a monastery was, was far too short to <laughs> learn any of this. So I'm delighted to hear that it was, in fact, rather more than that. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.